good evening everybody and welcome to our 11th HHL expert talk. First of all, I'm very delighted to see so many familiar faces tonight. I hope you've all been safe and sound and you have been coping well with the current situation. For those of you who are tuning in for the very first time tonight, I want to quickly explain what the HHL expert talk is and why exactly we're doing this. It is a virtual talk series with which HHL aims to address latest key topics in research to broaden the knowledge transfer on current social, economic and political topics. And all these talks are hosted and done by HHL experts. To briefly introduce myself, my name is Sigrid Fischer and I studied journalism and psychology at Indiana University and continued with a Master's of Science in Performance Psychology at the University of Edinburgh in the UK, where I also worked later on in my career. At HHL, I'm now responsible for our active alumni network, and as part of this, I'm delighted to be moderating the HHL Expert Talk Series. And as of right now, we've already welcomed more than 1,000 participants to our talk series. Before we're heading into tonight's talk, let me briefly give you a few facts and figures about HHL. HHL was established more than 120 years ago in Leipzig, Germany. It is our mission to, educa to educate entrepreneurial, responsible and effective business leaders through outstanding teaching, research and practice. We're driven by excellence to benefit our students, stakeholders and society. So where are we today? Today we have more than 700 students within our five programs and these five programs are our full-time and part-time Masters of Science and Management, our full-time and part-time MBA as well as our PhD program. We're proud to have more than 60 nationalities represented within our student body and to have an active alumni network of more than 3,000 alumni. As an entrepreneurial minded university, we're particularly proud that more than 300 startups, which created more than 40,000 jobs, were founded or co founded by HHL alumni. We're also happy to have more than 130 partner using universities within our cooperation and they are spread across the entire globe. It is now my pleasure to introduce tonight's expert, Professor Dr. Claudia Lehmann. Professor Dr. Claudia Lehmann is the holder of the LF Group Chair of Digital Innovation in Service Industries at HHL Leipzig Graduate School of Management. Since 2015, she has also been the Executive Director of HHL's CLIC, the Center for Leading Innovation and Cooperation. In this role, Professor Lehmann coordinates numerous German and European innovation projects and designs customized innovation strategies with her team and a broad network of institutions and experts. In the light of this, her work deals with methods and tools for the development and the delivery of digitally enabled services and business models. Tonight, our expert will be speaking about the impact of Corona on digitalization. It is my pleasure to now hand over to Claudia. For everybody who's taking part uh, tonight, let me explain to you that we will have a Q&A once Claudia has finished her presentation. So please type in all your questions into the chat. It is now my pleasure to hand over. Claudia, the stage is all yours. Enjoy tonight. So thank you so much also from my side. It's really a big pleasure to be here tonight. And um, yeah, I'm happy uh, to share some insights on this topic. Um, I'm pretty sure that everybody heard uh, or, or read over the last uh, 12 months something about the impact of Corona on digitization. Um, well, everybody's talking about this and uh, well, what does it mean? I would say um, just speaking about the three big words in this title, uh, uh, would fill more than an hour. Um, so therefore, I, I try to uh, be briefly and then give you some overviews and some insights um, on, um, yeah, uh, on, on what you can expect tonight and also on some uh, findings and, and uh, we found over the last month and also on our work. Um, as Sigrid said, we have roughly about 60 minutes tonight. So um, I will give a presentation on the topic and when the uh, uh, time is over, I'm super happy to discuss Wireshed, even if it is not as interactive as it would be in, in the lecture hall. So, um, 
how does the agenda looks like today? Um, well, I think in the uh, announcement of this talk, um, you found uh, three questions and uh, actually this is also our guideline for tonight. First of all, I would like to share some facts and figures how uh, digital transformation and the process is impacted uh, by Corona over the last year. Um, and then I would, um, secondly, I would share or would like to share some uh, examples on how Corona um, for, for, uh, favored the emerge of new digital products and services. And uh, yeah, last but not least, I would uh, like to talk about some challenges and problems uh, we are facing uh, right now and maybe also after the pandemic is over. So um, I would uh, like to start actually with a little story. So in 2096, um, the writer William Noak uh, published a book. It was entitled Placeless Society. And as the author sketches in um, his book, he, he, he uh, draws a vision of society which places uh, or in which places no longer play a role. And uh, modern communication technologies such as the internet would turn the world in an electronic village somehow. And um, there it doesn't matter anymore if you're either seeking in Mumbai or Munich. So um, as the author writes, imagine being in two or three places at once or imagine the ability to move objects around the world and instantly uh, and effortless um, as you would be the Al uh, Aladdin genie from the lamp. Um, so uh, this that's what a world would look like um, where you can be at three places at uh, places at once or the so so called society a placeless society um, is described as a world where everything and everyone is at the same time. So um, he also gives gives some examples like an um, insurance salesman um, could uh, work from home and telecommute uh, from his computer and talk to his potential customers or a computer company could write his so uh, the software in a small town in Utah or um, yeah, a hypersonic aircraft um, could put space and time uh, yeah, into perspective. Um, so uh, actually, when we look at this now, 25 years later, um, we are quite amazed how visionary this was. And, and today we see how um, how much of this is already possible. So um, yeah, that's uh, Today we can start a video call uh, home from the outback from Australia and sometimes to be honest this quality is better than the landline uh, at home would be or the local landline. Um, and I would say somehow the small smartphone we have every day in our hand has become somehow a substitute for home. And um, what I really like, I like the vision of the home button and I would say it's not called uh, uh, it's not called for this uh, for nothing because it turns somehow uh, into a mobile apartment with diaries, with folders, with music and books. And um, yeah, starting with this story, um, I would say the uh, Corona pandemic has um, uh, has accelerated this trend. So graduation parties, weddings, concerts, protests that would actually take place uh, on streets or schoolyards um, or somewhere in a public square have shifted to the net, net. and um, also the time of lockdown um, where we all um, so in the time of lockdowns we are somehow um, somewhere and as the British journalist David Gotthard describes it as um, it, it describes this for the uh, place bound people. And I think this is something important what we should have in, in, in our mind because not everybody is um, or have the privilege to work flexible from anywhere. So um, this is my little introduction on the topic. And um, actually I would um, like to um, yeah, I would like to talk now about the uh, impact of. Uh, oops, sorry, wrong, wrong task. Sorry. Um, yeah. 
So yeah, uh, now I would like to give you some figures and facts about the impact of uh, digital transformation and the processes. Um, therefore, I, I think the, this, this slide is quite interesting. Uh, what shows how companies actually reacting to the new market conditions. Uh, and this is a um, survey of uh, about 600 uh, companies and they have been asked as a consequence of the Corona crisis, um, yeah, well, over 70% uh, already adapted current product and services. So um, what we see here is that uh, it has a huge impact on the, on the um, companies. And um, what we see further that about 40% are started offering new product and services. So really being invent innovative and adapting to the situation and that you have to um, bring something to the market in, in a digital way um, is really in the head of uh, most of the companies. And I think even more interesting is this 45% um, realizing a change of their business model. And that's also what we see uh, in a lot of projects we are working um, with, uh, for example, uh, small and medium sized enterprises, um, which are now really use the time to rethink their business model and look for new business models and also crisis uh, or business model which are safe for crisis. So um, therefore I would also like to uh, share one more uh, slide. Um, yeah, so this is also asked the same group of person if digitization, digitalization is gaining um, on importance. And um, yeah, it's quite sure, um, or as you see here, it is gained a lot or uh, yeah, it, it gained a lot of importance. So over um, 86 percent uh, said that this is um, adaptable for the German economy and um, nearly the same percentage is also um, seeing this for their own company. Um, so about 12 percent uh, see it, it neither lost or gained importance, so it just stays the same, uh, but none of the um, interviewees answered that it lost importance. So um, where do we see this really um, happening? Uh, therefore, I would like to share one slide with you, um, which some of you might have seen already or heard about, uh, but I think this is a nice example just to illustrate what happened in the last year. So what we see here is a number of uh, visit um, at zoom.us uh, in million. So uh, you see here uh, at the bottom, um, Second text marker here. Uh, in, in in February, you were somewhere at uh, 900, but then here in March, you see really with a uh, boom <laughs> Zoom uh, uh, race, and uh, really from one day over the other, um, it was. Um, exploring the uh, usage of Zoom. And also on the other illustration here, it was quite interesting to see, especially at the beginning, how fast the people um, adapted to use Zoom as a collaboration software. Um, and as you see here, somehow they also uh, won at the beginning, we have to admit, um, the, the meeting app war. Um, it changed over the last year and all, uh, especially Microsoft Teams, um, picked up the pace, um, but what you really, what is interesting that the stock price low in 2020 in January uh, have been at $68 and it went up to a high in October 2020 to $568. So it's almost um, the, the stock value increased by 700%. Um, today, I mean, somehow it, it uh, um, that the hype uh, went also down. So today it's, it's $322, but still this is um, a, a huge number compared um, to what it have been in February last week, uh, last year. <laughs> All right, so, but it's pretty sure that not every company was able to realize those wins. Um, and I think it's quite interesting um, what have been the reasons for this. Uh, and then uh, I would like to share a couple more um, fears uh, with you. Um, 
I like really this um, illustration here because um, it also shows that the people are quite reflective with themselves. Um, this is a study what compares answers from 2019 to April 2020 uh, to November 2020. So as you see in uh, 2019, um, the people asked, um, how do you perceive your company in the context of digitalization? 39% uh, saw, saw themselves as first movers and seeing, you know, um, this over the last year, it changes because the people are working now on digitalization and digitalization. So they perceive how difficult it is. So just seeing this shift is quite interesting. So um, in the questionnaire end of last um, year, just 27% see themselves as first mover when it comes to digitalization. Um, and the other way around, for sure, uh, it's shown here. Um, if you compare the numbers from 2000 and, uh, 2019, where just 50, around 50% 50 saw themselves as uh, followers, um, this increased uh, to 70% in November last year. So um, that's quite interesting how, um, yeah, the, the people are more critical with themselves and also with, uh, with their companies. Um, and I think this is on the one hand um, good to see, but uh, I think the self-criticism uh, must not lead to resignation. I think this is a really important point um, when it comes to this uh, graph. Uh, because somehow we have to get it to work. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, I think the the um, very positive thing is that a large majority of companies is working on digitization or digitalization. So um, as you see at the top, um, a lot have been done when it comes to technology. So most people are they are purchased either completed or it's running or planned. Uh, they, they bought software, they bought hardware, they built up a digital infrastructure. And I think most important and interesting is the digital collaboration tools uh, they are using now. So over 66% of the people interviewed answered um, that they already completed um, the digital collaboration tools. And um, I also think uh, an interesting uh, fact, and it might also happen in your organization, we see it in our organization, how difficult it was to uh, realize digital signatures, you know, as a reliable object and that you can use it and that it has the same value like a written signature. Um, even here, it's interesting to see that 30% uh, already completed this and installed it and implemented it um, and uh, 30 percent uh, another 30 percent are working on it so um, it's also interesting um, if it comes to the human resource side um, so introducing home office i think we do not have to talk too much about this i mean somehow we needed to find solutions to this um, but i think it's interesting to see um, yeah, the uh, hiring of digital experts, right? People who are really expert in this field um, is something um, where we lag behind. I mean, there are different reasons for this. Some is that the, the uh, workforce in this segment is quite hard or the people are hard to find uh, and the demand is, is very high. But I would say this is one of the factors we really have to work in companies um, to have people who are expert in digitalization and um, really people who knew or who, who know how to create processes and how to digitize them. All right. So uh, last slide with numbers before I come to an example. Um, just asking the people um, during the crisis. So um, what are the reasons or what are the largest challenges uh, for digitalization in your company? And I think for me, it was very interesting to see the data protection requirements are one of the, oh, well, uh, one of the biggest challenges when it comes to the digitalization process in the company. Um, 
And uh, also, um, as we see, the lack of specialists um, that also reflects with the slide we just uh, saw before. Um, and I would say this is, when it comes to digitalization, a very important uh, factor, insufficient time. Because, as I said, I think when you really um, transform your company from an offline company to an online or a digital company and also digitize processes, it is important to rethink them. It's important to rethink and sometimes reinvent your company because you can't put the same processes you're running 100% in a digital world. And this, I would say, is one of the biggest challenges, especially when it comes to uh, mid-sized companies, that it is not so easy and that you have to have time to think about those processes. All right, so now I would like to give you some examples um, how uh, companies face the challenges of Corona. And um, yeah, I would like to share some downsides and also some uh, nice examples. Um, I I, an example I really like is, or I think it's very interesting is what is the company and how they are impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, as you might know, um, Disney is uh, very active in many business and area, um, and they have been highly affected by the pandemic. So, for example, I mean, they have a lot of retail, they have theme parks, they have movie theaters, or they have license uh, for movies which are showing in, in movie theaters. They are running cruise ships. They are also having live sports events, etc. So, I mean, as you can imagine, uh, how big the effect of uh, the pandemic was. Um, so, the revenue in the second quarter of 2020 dropped from 20 billion to 11 billion. So, almost um, half of the size, and uh, the the operating income dropped from four billion to one billion. So um, as you, I like to use stock prices somehow uh, as a reference, uh, <laughs> as you see here, the uh, stock price in December 2019 was at um, roughly $150. Uh, uh, and in March 2020, it dropped to around $80. So almost half of the price. Um, so what you see is this, this year, about 32,000 employees are expected to lose their jobs in 2021. So um, I would say this is uh, a really yeah, uh, illustrating example of what happens to a lot of companies. Um, what I, on the other hand, find interesting um, that uh, with Disney, um, what they made out of this uh, pandemic, or maybe I would say a lot of coincidences came together, but I would like to share some insights here. Um, they launched, uh, end of 2019, they launched uh, Disney Plus. So some of you might know, it's, it's uh, besides Netflix and Amazon Prime, um, it was the third uh, biggest uh, platform going to the market. So as I said, end of 2019, they launched it. And in, in uh, March 2020, they launched it in Germany. And what we see in March this year, um, Disney Plus hits 100 million subscribers. Subs subscribers. Sorry. And so um, they are already beating their four year goal after just 60 months months after launch. Uh, just comparing this to Netflix, Netflix, it took about 10 years to hit this milestone. So um, their new, new goal for now for 2000 and um, 2024 uh, is reaching um, 240 to 260 million subscribers. And um, yeah, what beside this is very interesting, um, how they're also rethinking their business model um, when it comes to the uh, cinemas. Maybe some of you, I mean, if you have kids, maybe you're much more familiar with this uh, than uh, just as a normal user, but last year uh, a couple of movies uh, were planned to come to the theater. For example, Mulan, they uh, filmed uh, the, the comic, they uh, did it in a, um, a real life uh, movie, and uh, so uh, they couldn't bring it to the movie theater. So the idea was bringing uh, Mulan to Disney Plus and uh, instead of br uh, to bring it uh, to the cinema. And um, But they also um, 
uh, charged a price of uh, around $30. I think it was uh, $29.99 bucks uh, for on top of the subscription fee. And um, yeah, 29% of all active US Disney Plus subscribers purchased Mulan at the weekend of the um, um, yeah, uh, the, the weekend when it was released. And um, that was quite interesting that at this week and at this particular weekend, uh, the download of the app increased by uh, 68%. And um, yeah, so the, the the money the people are spending or spent on the on the app, um, yeah, rose by nearly 200%. And um, just bringing this back to the stock market price uh, today, I just uh, uh, checked it out. Uh, the stock price is um, at $194. Um, dollars. So even above the uh, the the um, yeah um, the mark it has at, in December 2019. Another example I would like to give uh, is Etsy. Uh, and this was quite a platform um, yeah, running for quite a while. It was founded in 2005 in, in the US, um, but it was not so big and, 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 and not um, finding a lot of uh, users. Um, but they have been also a big winner of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so just to give you a little uh, overview, this marketplace, um, everybody can sell anything um, on this platform. Most, uh, I mean, you can compare it to, to eBay, eBay um, but it's more for handcrafted uh, things like, like if you sew, uh, sew something or if you uh, knit something, knit is the better word, uh, or if you handcraft, I don't know, um, uh, uh, nice clothes, etc. So um, you can put this on a platform and people from everywhere can buy it. Um, so the active sellers on the platform grew in the last year by 40%, so to uh, 3.7 million users. And um, also the active buyers increased by over 50%. So um, just seeing the buyers, uh, the people who are buying stuff um, at Etsy, it's nearly 70 million people. And um, yeah, so the interesting thing that um, the people on Etsy sold over 750 million masks in 2020 because uh, when there was a leak um, on masks everywhere, um, a lot of people, they, 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 they just, um, uh, 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 so um, mass and they sold it handmade mass at the platform and also very fancy mass etc. Um, and it's it, quite interesting because maybe some um, people from Germany still know Davanda. This was um, a German company who did actually the same and they have been uh, for a while quite uh, successful but they ran out of business in 2018. So uh, just seeing um, how a pandemic also can increase a platform like this is quite interesting. So um, just uh, giving this two examples, um, I would like to go back to a few slides with uh, uh, figures. Um, what you see here um, is also a nice overview how the average share of customer interaction, which are now digital, um, transformed over the last years. And um, what I particularly like here, uh, if you look at 2020, um, we have, uh, a, a, yeah, or if you see the step from 2019 to 2020, the globally the adoption acceleration um, is three years. So what does it mean? Uh, if you see the change here from uh, 2017, 2018, 2019, so 2017, uh, 17 to 18, it was almost the same, how the customer interaction, uh, which have been uh, digital, um, the percentage, uh, so from 2018 to 2019, it grew quite a lot, but seeing also the shift from 2019 to 2020, it's really accelerating. And uh, if you're putting this in years, um, it is a acceleration rate of about three years. Um, 
if you are talking about the services and the products, it's even more interesting. Um, asking the same people um, how the average share of products and services, um, which are partly are fully digitized, changed. Um, here you see um, a sex acceleration if you're talking globally. This is globally of Asia Pacific, Europe and North America. But if you're talking globally, um, we have an acceleration of seven years just in the last year. And um, I think this is quite interesting because uh, if you're talking about the impact of Corona on digitization or digitalization, um, it's uh, really hard to, to put this in numbers because um, a lot of people say, OK, now we are um, doing home office or we're doing teleconferences with each other. But I think this is not digitalization of, uh, of of companies and of businesses and of services. So uh, just seeing here this percentage is quite interesting. Um, uh, also, if you can compare Europe to North America, so if you have this here, um, it's interesting. Uh, I mean, both have nearly the same acceleration. Um, in Europe, it's even more than in North America. But if you see the percentage of products and services which are either partly or fully digitized. In Europe, we have about 50%, 50% here, and we have 60% uh, here. So really just the percentage, um, there's quite a big gap between the offerings in Europe and also in North America. So um, just briefly, um, this is a study of um, about 900 uh, C-level executives or senior managers um, just on the question. Um, yeah, they have been asked, what do you think? How long does it take to realize something when it comes to digitalization and uh, comparing it to the actual number of days, what it took them um, during the pandemic? So um, I would pick. Uh, I would like to pick the first one. So um, they have been asked. Okay, what do you think? How long will it uh, take to increase um, working digitally or or digitize the the collaboration between co-workers? And they expected that it would take about 450 days. And just seeing if they have to do it, it can be done in 10 days. So, I mean, these are the uh, average numbers, but it's quite interesting. And also, um, when it comes to the increased use of advanced technologies in operation, so what they uh, answered, um, how long it will take, there have been something around 600, 670. Um, but when it comes to the actual time, how long it take to realize it, it was nearly a month. So, um, Really, the acceleration factor have been something around uh, uh, 25. And um, yeah, it's interesting um, that uh, increasing spendings on data security or when it comes to spendings, um, it, it can be faster, but still it takes, it, it's not such a big acceleration factor like it is when it comes to the remote work or using uh, technologies. So, um, then um, uh, I would like to share a little more insights um, when it comes to the questions, what the people think or um, the, the interviewees answered when it comes to uh, how much of what is happening right now will stick. Um, and I think it's interesting to see that uh, most of the interviewees uh, say that the sh changing customer needs and expectations, they will stick. So about 60% um, of the interviews say, OK, this is going to stick because I mean, that's also what we realize right now. I mean, we are getting used to services. We are getting used to solutions and um, bringing this back or turning back time is quite uh, difficult. Um, so uh, also uh, I would like to highlight this number here um, just um, yeah, the the, uh, the the need or the experience um, change in this particular particular um, area when it comes to remote working and collaboration. I mean, almost all of the interviews uh, experienced that. Um, just maybe on the um, yeah, this is an interesting factor here when it comes to nearshoring and also uh, insourcing practices. 
Um, we see this now uh, quite often that companies are trying to uh, produce uh, nearby that they are trying to avoid long shipping and uh, long logistic logistic uh, ways. Um, and uh, we, but I think it's interesting that just 40% uh, think it will stick this way and 30% uh, um, they um, say this is going to change again. All right, so I have two more examples I would like to share with you um, when it comes to innovative ideas uh, um, or yeah, in, in the pandemic. So um, this is uh, Kinexon is a German IoT company and it's a large automotive supplier with a large um, Asian present um, or a, a large present in Asia. And it was quite interesting. They already sent their people home in February last year because they are so present in Asia. They saw and they also um, adapted that uh, uh, the Corona is going to be be a big hassle and um, so they, they, they uh, saw these um, challenges coming and um, but be, because they have to produce they uh, launched a wristband in, in already in May 2020 which warned employees so you see it on the on the left side here um, yeah here on the left side um, a wristband you can put it around your hand um, and it warns you if you are not uh, keeping the minimum distance between um, the other people. So um, this uh, solution is already used quite early before all this official uh, testing uh, regulations have been out uh, by the DFL and by a lot of other sports companies. Um, and uh, yeah, for example, Continental also used this just to use it for their co-workers so they have the right um, distance between them. All right. Um, another example um, is Lendis. This is a company uh, founded already in 2018 in Berlin. And um, what their original idea was uh, to rent um, office equipment. Um, so they, they um, rented like desks or um, chairs or um, yeah, like, like, like um, shelves, etc. I mean, they have not been the, the first ones. Um, for example, IKEA also tried the, uh, to, to realize this and to rent out um, like uh, desks and, and, and shares. Um, but with the um, uh, combined with the additional services of um, renting um, office equipment like computers, uh, printers on a monthly basis, they really went um, through the roof in the last year. Unfortunately, uh, they are not um, students from HHL, um, but uh, yeah, it's interesting uh, that they uh, offer now a service like like a whole bundle, a service bundle. Like they deliver the stuff, they also do the setup, they have the insurance, they have um, the software license, etc. So really, it's like um, yeah. Uh, you can uh, use it right away. You don't have to care about anything to set up, etc. So um, yeah, uh, you see here the numbers. Um, the pandemic led to increase uh, in demand by 300% on laptops and 50% uh, on furniture. So um, giving those examples on, on really nice ideas and innovative ideas, I would now like to um, give you some insights on, yeah, potential challenges and also risks when it comes to the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, I would like to talk briefly about uh, cybersecurity because I would say this is one of the biggest impacts when it comes to COVID-19. Um, we see here at the top uh, that cyber um, attackers uh, see the pandemic as an opportunity to really step up in their criminal, criminal activities. So 47% um, of all individuals uh, fall for phishing scams while working at home. So uh, you might know those uh, uh, scams. It's like you are getting um, 
an email uh, which is asking for passwords or also um, it was it is quite interesting that a lot of people failing for emails when it comes to news on Corona. Uh, so it like the hot news on Corona, uh, so many people died, etc. But those are most of the time fake news and those are used that people are coming on a, on a certain website. Um, also, the attacks on, on, on video conferences um, have been over half a million and um, on the one hand, just people um, entered the, the video conferences and made fun. I mean, if it is, um, excuse me, when it was a, um, yeah, if it was just somebody uh, joining the, the uh, video conference, but also um, a lot of data have been stolen in, in, in this um, regard. Uh, so people are using the same password for the uh, Zoom conference, for example. This was also the main reason why Zoom have been in the media and criticized um, very hard. And uh, yeah, I think uh, the last number, which is interesting, the changing number of, of, of cyber attacks. Um, so um, the cyber attacks um, using previously unseen mail were all methods. So things uh, which haven't been there before. Um, so in, in the be prior to the pandemic, um, it was by 20% and during the pandemic, this also increased by uh, 35%. So, I mean, on the, other, on the one hand, people had more time to think about new bad things, uh, but um, just seeing uh, also here an acceleration in cyber, cyber security and have this in mind is quite important. So, um, there are um, yeah, diverse reasons why, why this um, landscape uh, or the threats are also increasing. I mean, on the one hand, people who are might be not so so good and, and, and not the best friends of the companies are now working from home and with less supervision and fewer technical uh, uh, controls. So um, what is also seen quite often that people from the company are attacking the company and they're trying to steal data and also um, trying to do harm to the companies. Um, that a lot of cyber criminal, criminals recognize security measures are not sufficient and a lot of junior hackers are testing and, and, and uh, try out cyber attacks uh, because they are sitting home, because they have time. So this is quite interesting to see how many young people are uh, starting to do cyber attacks. Um, so um, on the other hand, um, people working from home, um, they, they spur cyber, uh, cyber attacks. So bring your own device with uh, not enough protection on it, um, not updated uh, mail scan, malware scan or virus scan. Um, and also the home Wi-Fi's um, have less security than working at uh, uh, from, from the company site. Well, and at the end, the human error, you never can cut out. So, um, yeah, just a recent example before I finish my talk. Uh, I think it was last week, um, uh, just to have this in mind and then bring to your mind what it also means to work in, work in a digital world. Um, last year we have seen um, a fire in European's largest cloud provider, OVH uh, Cloud. So um, a five, I think it was a five storage data center with over 12,000 servers burned down and over 3 million websites have been offline, um, including a lot of uh, government institutions. Um, they had to shut down their server because um, there have been leaks, banks, and also major, major law firms. Um, and yeah, partly the, those data have been completely destroyed because the people haven't been willing to pay an extra service for extra backups. Um, and what you see here, cost cutting, cost -cutting uh, measures have a big impact when it comes to a digital world. Because, I mean, the cloud, I mean, even if you're talking about the cloud, uh, that doesn't mean, you know, it's somewhere in the air. It is still on servers and having this in mind is important. And somehow you also have to think about your own um, security structure in, in companies. 
So um, yeah, that brings me to my last slide. Um, I would like to 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 end with three uh, theses um, when it comes to the mega trend of the future. And first of all, I think the question of digital, um, yeah, uh, sovereignty, uh, sovereignty is growing in, uh, and it's it's becoming more important um, than. I would say when it comes to the labor division and also if you're looking on this point um, yeah, on a global um, or from, from a global point of view, um, this is increasingly under pressure and this is something we have to think about and um, which we have to have in mind. And also, um, yeah, that innovation capabilities uh, become a core resilient factor. And uh, I'm pretty sure this is going to accelerate and increase over the uh, next years. All right, so as much from my side, and uh, now I'm happy to answer questions. First of all, um, someone is saying thank you for the very interesting presentation. Today, the EU proposed a digital COVID-19 certificate to allow EU citizens to travel inside of the bloc. Do you think this will help tourism reliant industry to recover? Hmm. It depends. I mean, uh, I, I'm. I think this. Um, or this is an example. Is that you are testing, then you put it in your your uh, phone, and then you have like a day pass. So that's what I know. That uh, you you have to test yourself in the morning, then you get a day pass. You have it in your phone, and then you can show it. Um, um, I would say this is a a, a good try. And um, I would say it depends, you know, what are the regulations in the different countries and um, if uh, countries are, um, you know, using the same um, approaches and also the same regulations. So I know in, in Tübingen, for example, they have a similar trial. Um, so they have everything is open right now, but you have to do the same in the morning. You get like tested and then you have like a day pass and then you can go everywhere. If you have, then you can go to the theater, you can go shopping, you can go to the hairdresser, etc. So um, I would say um, it's, it's a good try and I think it's also a nice um, possibility to use and, and, and combine the offline and the online world. Um, but you have to have the capabilities to, to test the people and also that people are using it. Hopefully this answers that. So to answer the question, I think it might be a solution for, um, yeah, for tourism. Thank you. Um, I have a question for you uh, right now. You said that um, there wasn't there was a nice overview where you showed execu executive thinking that their employees would be way slower in uh, realizing changes uh, than they were actually in the end. So you had a, a slide saying expected, and then how long they actually how long it actually took them. Um, so why do you actually think employees were that much faster in realizing certain changes than their executives thought they would be? Um, I mean, I think this is, uh, especially this uh, figure shows how people work. I mean, if we have a crisis, people are much more willing to adapt and to change because they see now is a need. I mean, we are talking about this uh, digitalization issues for years now. And, um, you know, we're trying to change processes. We try to change um, things, um, how they work in, in, in companies and also in value change. But somehow, you know, it doesn't have any impact and, and now it has an impact. Either I move or I do not move. Um, I, th I think a nice example is um, also, I don't know if you have somebody in the audience, but Deutsche Bahn, for example, this is this is a company. If there's a crisis, they're super fast, they're super uh, innovative, but in normal mode, let's call it this way, it, it takes quite some time. And I think this is not the only example what we have. Thank you. There's also another question from the audience. Um, again, thank you very much for the talk. What is your opinion on remote working in Europe, given the fact that every country has its own tax rules? Tax. OK, now, now I have to think a little bit. OK, how the combination of tax rules and home uh, remote working. Is this a question? Yeah, that's a question. 
Hmm. Okay, I have to admit I'm not um, the uh, expert on, on tax rules, um, but um, maybe the question goes in this direction um, that there are laws already established in Europe um, to, to tax releases if you are working from home and if you are using your own devices. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it's not um, released everywhere. I think in, in Germany it's still not released. Um, so what is my opinion about that? Um, I would say somehow um, you have to rethink not just tax, but also regulation when it comes to safety of workplaces. Because I mean, somehow last year we stepped into this, you know, working home, working remotely, and uh, still a lot of people are sitting at their um, uh, uh, couch uh, table. Yeah, you know, true. like like the small tables and, and having not having a proper um, uh, proper place to work. And I think uh, here it should definitely have different uh, or, or, or better regulations if you are buying um, uh, a desk or a computer a screen, etc. Um, on the one hand, you know, should, would be nice to have this uh, somehow regulated by, by the tax, but also, and this would be more important, as an employee, employer, employer, sorry, employer, um, you should also um, give those benefits to your to your people. I mean, I know some companies who said, okay, now you, you have 500 euros, please buy yourself a new um, uh, um, screen or a new table, etc. And you know, and not ha having this big uh, issues that you have to pay it by yourself and then put it somehow from your tax stone. Yeah, makes sense. Thank you very much. I have a question actually that uh, kind of you, you're leading into. You spoke about cybersecurity um, mm -hmm. at the end of your presentation and you said obviously there are certain challenges that are coming with um, the entire um, development. What are your recommendations for companies on the topic of cybersecurity? As you're saying, you know, there are certain threats that can actually happen if somebody is not um, overlooked that much anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, my recommendation would really um, that you have expert on premise. Mm -hmm. I mean, whatever premise mean, means in this context, uh, right? Um, but um, really people who have the time to, to uh, you know, to think about a security concept. Um, I mean, last, last week, I think it was a recent example on the Microsoft uh, Exchange server. Um, there have been an update and a lot of companies haven't been able to do this update on time. So the th threat for the server was also to be, in, uh, to be hacked. Uh, I know this from a couple of um, government uh, institutes last week. They, have to they had to take down their servers for three days. Three days. I mean, imagine this for, for a government uh, ministry. So, uh, and this is uh, just one example. There also have been a couple of uh, big uh, companies um, being threatened by this, I mean, to say easy update. Uh, yeah. and, and having people who are aware of this, you know, they're, who are really up to date, but also have the time to, to, to work on this. I would say this is something important. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to go back to the Disney, uh, World mm -hmm. Disney example. You talked about layoffs at Disney in connection with Corona. Do you think those jobs are irretrievably gone? <sighs> Big question. <laughs> uh, good question. I mean, this this uh, uh, this would lead us to a to a big discussion. Um, I would say uh, a lot of those jobs uh, will, or a lot of those people will have back their jobs after um, the theme parks are reopened, after the cruises are running again. Um, but I would say um, some of those jobs might, um, or some of those people have to reallocate their sell themselves. And uh, but this is uh, just one example of Disney. I think this uh, just illustrates what's happening in the society. Uh, and and um, my um, recommendation or my a lot of my thoughts uh, are surrounding about this theme because I think as a society, digitization and digitalization is changing us as a society, society tremendously. And, and we have to, I mean, 
I'm not 100% sure that all people are able to uh, learn new skills and to readapt. So um, to, to, to find solutions how this uh, society can can work and how we minimize the, uh, um, the digital gap um, is, is very important. I mean, I don't have a sol solution right away. I'm working on this. Uh, so if somebody would like to join me uh, to, to exchange some thoughts here, we're very happy and, 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 and uh, I would appreciate this. Um, yeah, so um, easy answer. Um, I would say a lot of people are getting their jobs back and uh, also a lot of people have to think and uh, uh, readapt their skills. They have to get new skills because in the digital area of um, D D Disney, there are, um, you know, a lot of people um, or a lot of jobs open. Yeah. Thank you. It's a big discussion. Sorry. <laughs> I know, <laughs> but still interesting. Um, there's loads of questions coming in now. I'm going with the next one. Uh -oh. How has the CO2 consumption changed in times of digitization, for example, using Zoom or MS Teams? And what are companies doing to reduce energy consumption for servers and so on? Uh, uh, so carbon dioxide, right? Exactly. OK. Um, to be honest, I don't have the um, uh, I don't have the numbers with me. Uh, so it's a, the exact, um, the exact, exact numbers. Um, but what we see uh, right now that in general, even if uh, almost no plane is flying, a lot of a lot of uh, automotives are not running anymore, or a lot of people do not commute. Um, the overall production of carbon dioxide uh, is not uh, decreasing tremendously. So and this also is um, yeah one reason is because our uh, consumption uh, let's call it the digital consumption is is, is uh, going up, and I would say this uh, for companies it is important to think also from this side you know just saying okay my cars are not running anymore is not enough and and uh, looking for concepts here is is quite important i know that there's uh, are quite some companies who are um, developing concepts uh, what you can do as a company i mean starting with green energy for for example but also um, you know looking for solutions um, let's say besides Zoom, uh, there are also green uh, um, solutions when it comes to the collaboration online. Thank you. That would be an easy one, but uh, there are better experts how you can do it uh, in your company and realize it. Thank you. Innovation seems to be a factor to weather the, uh, to weather the COVID-19 storm. What about companies that have not yet, uh, have not yet uh, made these processes or have put them in place? Do they face a double challenge due to financial setbacks and due to the pandemic? Um, for example, lost revenues means less liquidity to invest into establishing an innovation process and more digital business models. OK, also big question. Mm -hmm. um, so let's uh, split it up into two answers. Um, I would say uh, it is very important that I mean, let's call it just due to the pandemic, people are cutting off um, innovation activities because uh, I would say if we want to stay um, at the edge, you have to be innovative and you have to stay innovative. And um, so, uh, but I have to admit, and that's what I see in a lot of companies over the last, I would say six months, that's the first thing they cut off the innovation because right now it's seen somehow as not important or not so important right now. Um, but I would say um, that's not the way to, to go. Um, and the second part of the answer, uh, I think this was also in, in one of the slides, um, even if the people are recognizing that they have to invest in um, the um, infrastructure and, and in digital solution, um, the money um, is not running freely. You know, I, I, I can't say it better now, but um, so just because the need is there, is it is not 100% sure that the people are willing to spend uh, the money on it. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Answer somehow the question. 
definitely does. <laughs> um, on a different note, uh, the topic founding. What are you thinking about founders in times of the pandemic? How can they succeed and what competencies do you think do they need? Um, this is also uh, a, a, a big question and, and one of my colleagues, um, Elisabeth Berger, she's doing a lot of research um, how the um, pandemic um, influences founders because uh, this is, I mean, a lot of the parts, uh, even if, if it comes to, to uh, founders, if it comes to innovation, a big part is exchanging, you know, exchanging ideas, um, having the time spending uh, or having time spending together to create new ideas. Uh, this is now some Thing, uh, somehow uh, happening online. Um, I think uh, founders are more likely to, to adapt to the situation and uh, they have great solutions and they are, are fast to adapt. Um, but I would say uh, one of the, yeah, not, not the biggest, but, but one of the mistakes uh, maybe the government also made that they did not take particular um, yeah, a, a view on founders. Somehow they have been left behind, like like students in the last year. Um, this is, uh, I would say, we should think um, more. Um, yeah, for for founders and 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 uh, give a special support there. Thank uh, you for your opinion. Um, question on data protection now. Do you mm -hmm. think okay. data protection rules have to be revisited because of the new development to keep the EU in worldwide competition successfully? Um, so, also big questions today. Uh, so I would say I, I, I see this question also um, divided. On the one hand, I see somehow Europe um, that they should be able to, um, um, to to make use of this special situation. I mean, I'm I'm told. I, I mean, this is the easy answer. You know, change everything. Be like like Asia. Be like uh, North America, and everything is going to flourish. Um, so um, I, I see that uh, there are a lot of uh, boundaries and hurdles um, to adapt and, and to use these uh, data protection laws we have here in Europe. Um, and I would say with easier or more open or freely um, data protection laws, uh, it would be easier to, to adapt and to uh, create uh, services and businesses and also to, to collect data um, and own data, not uh, being, um, uh, oh, what's the word, um, dependent um, on, on data for, uh, collected by somebody else. Um, but on the other hand, uh, and this is more the difficult uh, uh, answer, um, I think uh, that can be a USP for Europe. You know, that somehow you know how the data is collected and what is done by your data and um, to find more solutions to make a benefit out of this, um, that would be, I would say, the, the better solution. So. Perfect, thank you. We're now going to question a question on federal funding. We have three more questions overall to go. Um, how should federal funding support the digitalization in Germany? Um, the person that's asking the question is saying, um, I hear many reports of schools buying tablets through the Digitalpakt Schule, but can't operate them as they can't fund services in the consulting process. What needs to change so that funding is holistic and actually enables the change um, fully? Um, so, um, good question. And um, I would, I see it also uh, in our school. Um, I mean, now we have tablets or we have PCs. You can rent the PC. Uh, you can, uh, if you don't have it at home, that's that's fine. I think this was the easier solution or the, the easier uh, um, task to fulfill. Uh, but now you have the problem. I mean, the either the school does not have the broadband, you know, to, to that everybody can be connected with their PC or tablet, that the uh, not all teachers can be online at the same time. I mean, that would be the first one, really having the infrastructure. And this, from my point of view, should be, you know, uh, sooner than later, somehow be realized that we can 
have a broadband internet connection everywhere um, and especially at schools because otherwise we do not have to think about um, you know uh, 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 new ways of, of teaching so um, I would say there shouldn't be a discussion how this I mean just just get it done and this is uh, I mean, I did. I was a, a student consulting uh, when I was studied, and this is quite some times ago. We were already discussing about this broadband uh, connection for uh, different sites in Germany, and 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 we are still discussing about this. And uh, I, I do not tell you something new that this is a big issue here. And um, but I see a lot of people who. Um, yeah, who, who who are really raising their voice. Um, I, I would just name uh, Verena Pauster, uh, who is really doing a great job um, on uh, digitization on schools. Um, but the question, yeah, when it comes to to founding um, or what is need when it comes to 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 founding, um, I would also say each school should have somebody who is able to um, uh, realize uh, infrastructure, you know, somebody who is able to set up a server, who is able to have an online program uh, for the for the pupils. And um, yeah, and not, I don't know, the sports teacher who likes to game online in his free time. So I would say uh, that should be something where uh, money is, is important to invest. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, those are, are all big questions. So. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Next time we have to have it in the audience because I think it's it's much nicer to have a discussion about this than just having my opinion. Uh, but yeah. Still, thank you very much for your opinion. <laughs> um, another question, uh, second last one. Is there a difference when it comes to digital transformation of companies from different industries? So uh, to make it more precise, are there industries that are better prepared than others? And if so, why? Um, in general, I would say uh, the challenges the companies are facing are quite similar. Mm -hmm. So, um, but for sure, there are uh, industries um, which are struggling a little bit more than others. I mean, I, I studied aviation engineering, so I, I think the aviation industry is, is a great example right now. I mean, um, this has been a company or a industry which is already quite digitized and 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 have you know all the platforms where um, from arranging the flights and uh, planning and also supervising booking so but really fulfilling the service um, it's quite difficult and I would say this is when digitalization comes to an end. I mean, the, the biggest challenge when it comes to service and I mean, I have the a share for, for service industries or digital innovation service industries. The biggest challenge when it comes to services is that you cannot store it and that you cannot consume it afterwards uh, when it comes to, to, to um, uh, the food industry, etc. I would say all those um, industries which have still a very high interaction with customers um, have fa are facing the biggest challenges. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And now here's the last one on um, question on politics a little bit. Um, okay. How can we're going with the big ones? Um, oh God, <laughs> I see it. it I mean, it's, it's I mean that that shows really how um, how much this topic moves people. This is quite I mean, um, yeah. Go, go with the question. I try my best. Yeah. How <laughs> can politics foster a better innovation culture in Germany to drive digital transformation in businesses and in public administration? Hmm. Um, I would say there are different ways to really foster this in um, in government and also in, in, in um, public administration because uh, and I see a lot of good uh, pilots here, um, especially here in, in Saxony. We have, I mean, you have to have some people who really want this and, and people who drive this. And, uh, but still um, the need is, I would say, when it comes to the public administration is not high enough. Uh, so, um, but 
I see it more positive than I would say I saw it a couple of years ago. Um, so uh, this is this is uh, the one part. And how can uh, politics uh, foster innovation? I would say this is coming back to a, a society question. Um, for me, innovation goes hand in hand with um, failure and the the. Um, allowance of, of failure and this is I don't know if this is really if we here in Germany um, are learning to, to accept this and not um, punishing everybody who is admitting a, a, a failure or uh, if something is not working because for me innovation is you know try and uh, um, try to adapt and, and really make it better. Um, I would not say it's all about failure but it's about accept if it is not uh, fulfilling 100% what you expected um, the innovation to, to realize. Thanks. So, um, yeah, but how politics maybe, um, yeah, uh, uh, be a role model? Maybe. <laughs> you, are, you are definitely one. <laughs> oh, okay. um, thank you so much also with the idea of almost having a mindset um, switch to a certain degree of the trial and error yeah. um, method that you can go with and then also drive others with you. Um, wonderful. Yeah, because I mean, this is this is what I see right now. I mean, there are some people also in, in politics who are willing to to try things. Uh, I, I really like the I, I don't know the name right now, but the mayor of Rostock. Um, he is, I think, the, the only mayor in Germany who is not German. He, he's a Danish guy and um, actually he, he built uh, uh, furniture before and he did really. I mean, if you're interested, um, really look at uh, follow him on, on LinkedIn uh, and uh, also he's quite often in talk shows, but it's quite interesting how um, you know, people can drive innovation and digitalization and uh, really bringing people together and have um, somehow a um, company or, or really an uh, entrepreneur mindset can help a lot, I would say, to, to bring uh, digitalization uh, forward. Klaus Ruhe Madison uh, is, I think, yep. the guy you're speaking about. Yep. Yeah. Really cool uh, guy. So. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> On that note and uh, with that lovely outlook as well, thank you so, so much for your insight, for your time, for taking all those questions and for giving or sharing your opinion with us. It's been an absolutely de delightful evening. Um, a virtual round of applause to you. Um, and I'm also thinking I can speak of the audience um, that, you know, we see it with all these questions. There's so much to speak about and hopefully maybe we can expand that conversation or the discussion um, when we are allowed to be physically amongst each other again. Um, for everybody who joined us tonight, also thank you for all of you um, for tuning in. Um, it's been a pleasure hosting you and um, we have a next um, HHA Expert Talk coming on the 14th of April. And if you're interested, uh, join us then. Um, up until then, I would say have a lovely evening, stay healthy and sane. And yeah, thank you all for joining and thank you, Claudia. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Ciao. Bye.